any of the steps to it. Although maybe. Thank you, Logan. Appreciate that. Isn't it amazing that we have young people that can get up in our worship service and minister to us in that way? I trust you're having a happy Sabbath today. Can everybody hear me okay? Working better than this other mic, so great. Before we get started, I'd just like to ask one more word of prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, today uh, we just want to praise you for being a God who uh, just loves and cares for each one of us so much, Lord. Today, as I speak this message, I pray, Lord, that these words that I speak uh, will come from you. And that if there's anything that I have here to present uh, that is not correct, Lord, I pray that you change those words coming out of my mouth so that we hear only what you want us to hear. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> Our sermon title today is, Are You a Watchman? The texts that I'll be reading are from the King James Version. Again, my question to you is, are you a watchman? First, we should define what a watchman is. Watchmen in the Bible were guards responsible for protecting towns and military installations from surprise enemy attacks and other potential dangers. Ancient Israelite cities often stationed watchmen on high walls or in towers. Their job was to keep watch and warn the townspeople of impending threats. The Hebrew word translated watchman means one who looks out, one who spies, or one who watches. Sometimes watchmen were scouts who looked out for approaching friends, as well as enemies. Does that sound like you? Are you a watchman? If so, why is it necessary for you to take that role? Again, I'd like to read our opening text in Matthew 24, 42 to 44. It says, Watch therefore, for ye know not what hour your Lord doth come. But know this, that if the guardian of the house had known in which watch the thief would come, he would have watched and would not have suffered his house to be broken up. Therefore, be also ready, for in such an hour as you think not, the Son of Man cometh. We do not know the hour of Jesus' return, but we are called to be ready to watch. By watching, we can be assured it will not be to us as a thief in the night. 1 Thessalonians 5, 2-4, we read, For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as the thief in the night. For when they shall say, Peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them, as prevailed upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. Does a pregnant woman know she's going to have a baby? Does she have signs when the time is near? Or is she totally oblivious to the signs of childbirth? Not having gone through childbirth myself, Although society now tells me I should. <laughs> I think it would be fair to say that she has strong signals as to when the child is ready to be born. She can choose to keep those signs and prepare to give birth or ignore them and be caught off guard. Verse 4 it says, But ye, brethren, are not in darkness that they should overtake you as a thief. What do we need to do to be assured we are not in darkness as to the period of time of Christ's return? In Revelation 3.3, 3, we read, Remember therefore how thou hast received, and heard, and hold fast, and repent. If therefore thou shalt not watch, I will come as thee a thief, and thou shalt not know what hour I come upon thee. The verse is telling us to receive and hear, hold fast and repent. What is it that this verse is talking about? Receiving and hearing what? And how does that allow us to hold fast till the end? Let's see if we can answer this question. In Matthew 24, or cha Matthew chapter 24, um, we have some answers to God. In verse 1, we read, And Jesus went out and departed from the temple, and his disciples came to him for to show him the buildings of the temple. And Jesus said to them, See ye not all these things? Verily I say unto you, There shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. As he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, 
Tell us, when shall these things be? And what shall be the sign of our coming, the end of the world? And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. Thank you, John. Thank for that children's story that fit in very well here. There have been many throughout the years that have claimed to be Christ. Many times those who followed, who followed them ended up confused. They were willing to give up their lives in order to show their allegiance to the false Christ. And as Jonathan mentioned in the children's story, uh, false Christ will attempt to uh, show signs and wonders that will, that will draw us away from, um, from what the Bible truly really says, so we need to keep our guard up. In verse 6 it says, Ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that ye not be troubled. For all things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. And there shall be famines, and pestilence, and earthquakes in diverse places. The senseless violence that is all around us is staggering. We hear about Russia and Ukraine all the time in the news. And the tragedies that are going on there are, are just horrendous. But there are other conflicts going on throughout the world. In Ethiopia, Yemen, Nigeria, Afghanistan, Lebanon, Sudan, Haiti, Colombia, Myanmar, Mexico. The list does not include the violence that happens in our large cities and now in small towns also. Without, what about famines? Are we hearing more and more about food shortages throughout the world? Lack of enough food in poor countries has been increasing steadily over the past three years after 10 years of decline. Pestilence, while well, we sure know about that, COVID had turned, has turned our world upside down and shows us no sign of letting up. COVID is real, no question about that. Whether it was planned or not, it was used to further the agenda of control and manipulation, which are the trademarks of Satan and his workers. Earthquakes and natural disasters are all around us. Satan will use all these events to promote his agenda through whatever means possible to set up a false day of worship. Verse 8, all these things are the beginning of sorrows. If what is going on is the beginning of sorrows, we need more than ever to rely on our faith in Jesus and an understanding of what is going on in the world to stand strong through what will come next. Remember in this world there are only two sides, good and evil. No between. God or Satan, there is no between or middle ground. Everything we do, say, think, act out is either of God or of the devil. Every tragedy that happens in the world will draw humanity closer to God or closer to Satan. <clears throat> Satan will use tragedy to scare people into following him. Verse 9, there shall, Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted and shall kill you, and ye shall be hated for all nations for my name's sake. And they shall... And then shall men be offered, and shall betray one another, and shall hate one another. There are approximately 360 million Christians who live in countries that have a high level of persecution just for following Jesus. Lives are lost for the gospel message every day. It is mind-boggling that simply because they believe in Jesus, people are persecuted. Jesus said, remember the world Remember the word that I said unto you, the servant is not greater than the Lord. If they have persecuted me, they will also persecute you. John 15, 20. Because Satan hates Jesus, he also will hate those whom Jesus created. Verse 11. And many false prophets are wise and shall deceive many. How can we not be deceived by false prophets? The Bible is clear. In Isaiah 20, 8, 20. It says, to the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no truth in them. We need to be discerning when it comes to following the teachings of anyone who is not consistent with the Bible teachings. Within our own church, there are those who will be deceived. We need to be watchful at all times. In verse 12, and because iniquity shall abound, the love of many will wax cold. Iniquity shall abound. Do we see that in society today? 2 Timothy 3, 2 and 4 tells us what iniquity will look like or does look like. Verse 2, for men shall be lovers of their own selves, 
covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient parents, unthankful, unholy. Verse 3, without natural affection, two traitors, false accusers, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, high-minded, lovers of pleasure more than God. But there is good news in verse 13. But he that shall endure to the end, the same shall be saved. That is what I'm holding on to. There are other signs that we are to watch for as we come near to the time of the end. In the Great Controversy, page 588, we read, To the two great errors, the immortality of the soul and Sunday sacredness, Satan will bring the people under his deceptions. While the former lays the foundation of spiritualism, the latter creates a bond of sympathy with Rome. The Protestants of the United States will be foremost in stretching their hands across the gulf to grasp the hand of spiritualism. They will reach over the abyss to clasp the hands of the Roman power, and under, under the influence of the threefold union, this country will follow the steps of Rome in trampling on the rights of conscience. Do we see immortality of the soul? Immortality of the soul as a movement gaining strength in our society today. Most Christians and non-Christians alike believe that the soul lives on forever in some form or another. It's rather, it's rather bizarre to read the many unbiblical ideas about what happens when you die. Without clear biblical reference, we can be deceived easily on this issue. The shift in Protestants' adoption, adopting the immortality of the soul, aligns them with the Roman Catholic Church. I'd like to spend a little time talking about the Sunday sacredness referred to in the Great Controversy quote above. This issue has long been a topic of discussion among Christians, especially Adventists, who for beauty that Sunday worship, that is forced Sunday worship, is the mark of the beast or the mark of the papal system. The changing from Sabbath to Sunday worship is considered to be their mark of authority. The mere fact that they were able to state that they are changing the day of worship from Saturday to Sunday and have almost all the Christian faiths adopting their mark is quite telling. The sign has been, this is according to a Catholic record of London, the sign has been a mark of power ever since Justin Dean. Sunday is our mark of authority. The church is above the Bible, and this transference of Sabbath observance is proof of that fact. By keeping Sunday, Protestants submit to the Vatican's authority over them. Soon the final resurrection of the Holy Roman Empire will challenge everyone to keep the Sunday or else. This topic can be a touchy, touchy subject to some in our church. A church whose mission is to proclaim the three angels' message. I have heard some say Sunday laws are a long way off, if they happen at all. Others say that it works that it is works-oriented to mention that people should keep the commandments of God. I was told one day by a church member that we should not be looking at the papacy as close as a, as looking at the papacy uh, as the Antichrist, for there are many Antichrists. If the papal system is not the Antichrist, then our Bibles and our belief in Jesus' second coming are in question. Ellen White would be a false prophet. The evidence is clear. The word of God is true. And the spirit of prophecy is harmonious with the Bible teachings. I'd like to share an article that gives a clear picture of where we are headed related to Sunday observance as the Lord's Day or Sabbath. This is from Vatican News. And it reads, The bishops of the European Union and the European Sunday Alliance are urging EU leaders to protect synchronized free time. That's what they call it which most nations traditionally, traditionally observe on Sunday. Synchronized free time should be a priority in the EU social policy agenda according to European bishops and other organizations. According to the network, which includes more than 100 national Sunday alliance, trade unions, employers, organizations, civil societies, associations, churches, and religious communities in the European Union. A full day of rest per week is indispensable to recover. Indeed, they say, a common day of rest truly increases well-being and brings a positive effect on health. Of course, we know that to be true, don't we? 
Only during a common day of rest is it possible to pursue volunteer work, civic engagement, joint social, sports, or faith related activity, family time, and more generally, to spend time together. EU bishops also recall that humans are social beings, and for many of them, their health requires more than individual time off at scattered random moments in the week to spend alone. A day free of work recognized by tradition or customs is therefore essential to disconnect literally and figuratively. The Alliance thus urges political leaders in Europe to make synchronized free time a priority, thus making a tangible, visible, and cherished improvement to the lives of citizens across Europe. So I looked up what countries are actively pursuing Sunday legislation at this time. And within, uh, within the last uh, four years, these countries all have implemented some form of, of Sunday, Sunday laws, mainly um, pertaining to shopping um, or extracurricular activities. Um, but most of the countries that had started uh, enacting um, um, like a uh, Sunday a month off, Stores be closed on Sunday a month, or two Sundays a month. They they pretty much all have a graduated increase. That down as as time goes on, that it would increase, and that more and more days Sunday days would be would be uh, included. So um, Tonga um, is the only country that has 100% closure on Sunday. There's literally nothing open on Sunday. They can actually be put in prison or fined for working for or. Um, doing something that nobody uh, so The other countries that currently, within the last four years, since um, about 2017, um, is uh, Belgium, Austria, Greece, Iceland, Germany, Poland, Hungary, Italy, and New East Britain all have some form of, of Sunday legislation just within the last uh, three years. And this is clearly a global movement, uh, especially now with the global warming, Climate change going on. There are there are many groups uh, that are uh, suggesting that we take a day off. That Sunday be the day that uh, society shuts down uh, in order to save energy and to help uh, uh, save the planet. And when you hear all this this talk about it, you understand that the, the, the climate change issue is a perfect issue to get everybody on board because everybody can. Uh, See that things are going on in the world, and can logically uh, think that oh, well, taking a day off on Sunday to help the environment is, is a good thing. Um, so the environmentalists would, would love it. The Catholic Church, of course, would would like it very much, um, and the evangelical church people would would get along with it, would, would go along with it too. So it doesn't have to be couched as a religious issue at the beginning. It can be couched as an issue that everybody can get on board with. I believe that that's where it's going to start, and that's that's where the the talk is is going. When you listen to different groups that are promoting um, uh, Sunday Sunday rest, uh, the trade unions also are um, are on board with it too. Many of the trade unions are advocating for for Sunday uh, Sunday off for their employees. And trade unions are regaining strength and power, able to convince lawmakers to pass laws and promote their agendas wherever they, whatever they may be. According to the latest annual Gallup poll on union favorability, 71% of Americans approve of labor unions, the highest rate in 60 years. Now we are told in, in the spirit of prophecy that labor unions will play a big part in the end time in promoting the Sunday legislation. Um, and as labor unions start gaining in strength, they gain in power and ability to influence uh, um, country leaders uh, to get these laws enacted. The number of people who view unions favorably is on a clear upward trend, up from 60% last year, 64% the year before, and 52% a decade ago. This is also from the Great Controversy, page 592. The dignitaries of church and state will unite to drive, persuade, or compel all classes to honor the Sunday. 
The lack of divine authority will be supplied by oppressive enactments. Political corruption is destroying love of justice and regard for truth. And even in free America, rulers and legislators, in order to secure public favor, will yield to the popular demand for a law enforcing Sunday observance. Liberty of conscience, which has cost so great a sacrifice, will no longer be respected in the soon coming conflict. We shall see exemplified the prophet's words, the dragon with wrath of the woman, and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which kept the commandments of God, and have the testimony of Jesus. What is our responsibility as watchmen who have been given the message the world needs to hear? It is to proclaim the three angels' message to all who will listen. Like the watchman on the wall of the city who sees an enemy approaching, he is to call out for all to get ready to protect the city from this enemy. Revelation 14, 6 and 12, we know well. And I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth, and to every nation, and kindred, and tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God, and give glory to him. For the hour of his judgment is come, and worship him that made heaven and earth, and the sea and the fountains of water. And there followed another angel, saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast in his image, and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment descended up forever and ever. And they have no rest day or night who worship the beast and his image, and whoever so receive the mark of his name. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God. Jesus. We are called to be a commandment keeping people, keeping God's commandments because we love Him and want to serve Him. If we have specific truth the world needs to hear, is it not our responsibility to tell others what we know? John 10 10 says, The thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. I am come that they might have life and they might have it more abundantly. If people understood that God is for them and not against them, that eternal life is given freely to those who choose to follow Jesus, then sorrow would be replaced with joy, sadness with peace, and knowledge that they are loved beyond their wildest dreams by the God who created them. Revelation 1, 1 to 3 reads, The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him, to show unto his servant things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John, who bore record of the word of God and of the testimony of Jesus and of all things that he saw. Blessed is he that readeth, and they that hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written therein, for the time is at hand. As watchmen, if we know Bible prophecy and understand that danger is ahead for those, ahead for those who do not love God, should we share it with those we love, our family, our friends, neighbors, workers, those who live close to us, and those in foreign lands? Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Is Christ's command to his followers not that they are all called to be ministers? Christ's command to his followers not that all are called to be ministers or missionaries in the ordinary sense of the term, but all may be workers with him in giving glad ties to the fellow men, to all great or small, learned or ignorant, old or young, the command is given. That's from education to support. Upon everyone who knows the truth, for this time rests the responsibility of making it known to others. The servants of Christ are in large measure responsible for the well-being and the salvation of the world. They are to be cold laborers of God in the work of winning souls to Christ. The theme that attracts the heart of the sinner is Christ and him crucified. On the cross of Calvary, Jesus stands, revealed to the world in unparalleled love. Present him 
Thus, to the hungry multitudes, the light of his love will win men from darkness to light, from transgression to obedience, and to holiness. Behold, Jesus upon the cross of Calvary arouses the conscious to the heinous character of sin and nothing else that not, of sin as nothing else can do. What other way? What other ways can we be watching? Luke 21, 34 to 36 says, "And take heed to yourselves, lest any, lest at any time your hearts be overcharged with suffering and darkness and cares of this life." So that day come upon you unaware. For as a snare shall it come on all them that dwell on the face of the earth. Watch ye therefore, and pray always, that ye may be accounted worthy to escape all things that shall come to pass, and to stand before the Son of Man. We are called to take heed to yourselves, verse 33, to pay attention to what is going on in our lives that will draw us away from God and cause the coming of Jesus to be as a thief in the night to us. For me, um, several years ago, it meant looking at the things I was watching on TV, programs that were secular and did not glorify God in any way, movies I had in my home that were not spiritually uplifting, and even those I thought were uplifting were not in tune with the Bible teachings. There was many Thing, if not everything that comes out of Hollywood these days that fits into that category. Um, it, uh, it, the messages that are in the movies today, uh, Karen and I were um, watching a uh, gentleman talk about the, the movie um, The Passion of Christ. And they went through and listed all the fallacies that are in that movie. And everything is a fallacy in that. Huh? All Catholic doctrines. All Catholic doctrines. And so we have to be really careful. Uh, the Christian community looked at that movie and thought that was the best movie, the most accurate movie, the trade of Christ. But when you understand what the underlying fallacies are in that movie, it is so clear that it is, it is of Satan. It's just absolutely clear. And unless we are discerning and really pay attention to some of the things that we have in our homes that seem innocent, um, I believe that they are actually leading us in a direction that is not, not towards Christ. So be mindful. We should guard ourselves as to what we allow in our minds through television, movies, internet, YouTube, Snapchat, Twitter, etc. There's so many things out there nowadays. Anything that is drawing our attention away from God should be done away with. Being a watchman for our family, protecting them from Satan's influence, guiding them to a path that leads to Jesus and his love. How about our church? Is there wisdom in being a watchman for our members? When we hear information that is helpful in understanding Bible prophecy or see events around us that give strong indication that we are quickly drawing near the close of time, we should be sharing this information with them, giving them encouragement through the difficult times that we will be living through. Should we be watching for our community and, and a world at large, watching for those who do not know the Bible truths? I believe the answer is a clearly strong yes. Unfortunately, there are those who do not want the end time message or the prophecy message spoken of in Revelation to be presented in our own churches. They say we should just get along with Christians and not rock the boat. It is time we rock the boat. Time to share the truths of the Bible as never before. And sharing those truths boldly with others will rock the proverbial boat. This is from uh, the book Second Coming of Christ, I believe, uh, from Alan White. The time from the end of the prophetic period to the coming of Christ is emphatically the waiting, watching time. Those who watch as our Lord commands will know the time. No man will make it known for it is not revealed to man in the scriptures. Angels will not make it known, though they may minister to and communicate with the children of men. Neither will the Son, but the Father will make it known when he speaks again from heaven. He once spoke the Ten Commandments in the hearing of the people. The voice then shook the earth. When he speaks again, the heavens and earth will both shake, says Paul. His voice then shook the earth, but now he hath promised, saying, 
Yet once more I shake not the earth only, but also heaven, Hebrews 12, 26. The Lord also shall roar out of Zion, and utter his voice from Jerusalem, and the heavens and the earth shall shake. Joel 3, 16. During this waiting and watching period of earth's history, we are called to watch for the coming of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Even more, we are to share what we know of others. Their life may depend on our faithfulness. The cry of a watchman took precedence over any current conversation at the time. To ignore the watchman was to invite death for the loss of all your health.